Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and this is Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our discussion, dealing with all kinds of issues relating to developing a new green economy. We're joined again by Bob Pollan. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Hi, Paul. And once again, Bob is co-director of the Perry Institute in, at Massachusetts Amherst, and he is also author of Global Green Growth, which is a big report where you have modeled how to get to a green economy. And where do people find this, anyway, this Okay, report. so the, I have two reports, and I have, I want to say I have uh, wonderful co-authors on both of the reports. So the Green Growth, which was um, put out by the Center for American Progress, is online, so you just type in Green Growth, Robert Poland, they'll get there. Global Green Growth uh, is not quite out yet. It'll probably be out in a matter of two, three weeks. So that would be out you can find them both at, at the website of our institute, okay. Political Economy. All right, Institute. so I'm going to quote. Can uh, I just mention my yeah. co-authors? Oh, now? yeah, please. So my co-authors uh, in both studies are uh, Heidi Garrett-Peltier and James Heinz. For the domestic green growth study, a, a fourth co-author is Bracken Hendricks. And in the global green growth, the fourth co-author is Shovik Chakraborty. All right, good. So Bob now feels that he is... Properly shared credit, thank you. Uh, which is well deserved. Yeah, I understand. Uh, all right, so I'm going to quote Bob Pollan, okay. who told me in conversation, because you may have written this, but I don't know. But you told me in conversation that John McCain had a version of cap and trade, mm -hmm. and if it had passed, it would have been a major achievement. Mm -hmm. um, but my everything I've ever heard about cap and trade is that it's essentially a way to financialize the problem. It's a way for Wall Street to create kind of a new kind of derivatives market of one form or another, yeah. and people are going to, like another big boondoggle, really. Mm -hmm. And most examples I've, I've seen, with the exception of, of, of California, I understood, that had a cap and trade that kind of worked because it all stayed within California. But as soon as the trade part goes international, yeah. It's impossible to regulate, and I think every you know cap and trade is you you're, you're allowed this much emissions you have to cap, but you can have higher emissions if you, for example, pay someone to plant trees somewhere, or, you know somehow someone else reduces emission because you pay them to reduce emissions, and then you can be at a higher level. So if you're doing coal, you actually may not have to reduce your coal at all if you're willing to keep paying someone else to reduce. Uh, the problem is, how do you actually make sure the reduction is real? Mm -hmm. So why do you think it would have been achievement if m most of this stuff looks like it's smoke and mirrors? Okay, well, thinking about it politically, uh, keep in mind, John McCain was the presidential candidate of the Republican Party in 2008. The Republican Party today uh, basically, as we've discussed, denies that there's any problem at all. So it's just important as a marker to uh, show where the Republican Party was around climate change issues not that long ago, okay, eight years ago um, or, or less. So the influence of the, of, uh, we know the Koch brothers and others in the Republican Party is now they can't even talk about that. No, they, I mean now, as I said, I mean what, what they now say, the Republicans, they, they don't want to say that they're climate change deniers, they say, well, what do I know? So uh, I'm not a climate scientist, so let, the, let those scientists debate it out. Meanwhile, there's going to be no progress. Whereas, you know, McCain himself was advocating something uh, which would have been significant relative to where we are today. George Bush signed a law that uh, would have reduced emissions in buildings, in the federal buildings, by 30 percent. That was in 2007. The Republicans were for it. So in terms of the politics, there has been massive retrogression, and that means that we can also go back, you know, to a more positive framework, even including the Republicans. Now, in well, terms, why does that mean that? Because well, what, we were we, all, it wasn't that long ago. No, but we know what what happened here is we know that f the fossil fuel industry through enormous amounts of money at creating a section of the Republican Party that won't allow this and changes in the finance, uh, election financing laws have made it even easier to do all of that. And that ain't getting undone anytime soon. Well, something, I mean, there has to be, you know, effective political struggle. And, you know, one of the parts of the political struggle is to remind people that George Bush signed this law, that John McCain supported uh, a cap law. Now, what about the cap and trade part? Now, it, to me, if let's just speak uh, general principles first. If you can reduce emissions 3% per year, 
then I don't particularly care about the trade part. Whether good, bad, indifferent, that's to me that's secondary. But if but if the trade part's ineffective, you're not yes, reducing. Yes, yes. So the the issue with the trade part is whether it renders the cap ineffective, whether it just makes it so easy for people to get around it, and whether you can't even adequately monitor whether you are getting emissions down by 3%. So, yeah, I completely... I mean, I've seen some studies of European cap and trade where somebody went to, like, to northern Africa and actually looked at some of the offsetting offsets, and it turned out most of the, most of the offsets would have happened anyway. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, you know... So the trade part, so it, but the but the point is, it matters to say that whether it's it regulation matters. or trade, because so far trade seems to be nonsense. Right. So the real issue is, okay, you know, as in California, the law says three percent reduction in emissions per year. Can can we observe that happening? That's critical. And if having a trade part. Uh, prevents you from even monitoring it, then yeah, get rid of the trade. Is the California trade allow international or is it just within California? I'm not sure. Okay, because that's a big deal. Because yeah. if it's within California, you might be able to regulate yeah. it, but yeah. if it's not, then, then yeah. it's kind of meaningless. Yeah. Now, the other part with a, with a carbon cap or a carbon tax, either one, um, it's going to raise the price of oil, coal, and natural gas. And that's going to hurt low-income people. More, rich people won't even notice it. Low-income people will. And that is going to be a hardship for them. And that's, again, a reason as to why they might be against the whole green thing. They said, well, yeah, the rich people, they're all fine. They, they don't even notice it. But it's going to reduce my standard of living by 10% because I still have to pay for home heating oil. I still have to drive my car to work. So one of the arguments for like a, a, uh, a cap is to include the so-called dividend idea, which is the revenues generated by selling carbon permits or by having a carbon tax get redistributed back to people on an equal share. Everybody gets the same amount back so that the net effect in terms of just money is going to be positive for most people. Yeah, we, I've always had trouble making sense of this because it seems to me that unless there's price regulation, uh, these energy companies will simply raise their price by the amount they have to pay for the permit. So even if you get it back, you're back in a, what's the point of it? Well, all? let's say you're, the price goes up, but then all, all, all a, a, an increasing share of that price is going to be taxed, and then the money goes right back to everybody. It seems like kind of convoluted. It is, like, yeah. They, they it's, think it's, a, like, it's a way to recognize, again, the fact is that any t if you're going to raise fossil fuel prices, it's going to hurt low income people. Well, the one way it could hurt less is if you pay for permits, I suppose, uh, but I would regulate and tax, um, and then put that money into real subsidies to make houses and such more efficient. Right. Then, then the thing actually ma makes sense yeah, to get Yeah, so that's, you know, so I would argue that that would, should be a big part of the agenda. If you're going to have revenues from a carbon tax or, or a cap, put that into making solar energy really cheap. Put that into making efficiency completely available to everybody, and you get your big savings that way. So I would say, you know, some combination of the two things. And again, the point is, this could happen at a state level. You don't have to wait for all the feds. of this. All of this could happen at the state, or even the municipality level. Cities should—they are wasting taxpayers' money by running buildings mm. uh, inefficiently. Okay, so in the next segment of our interview, we're going to talk about private versus public. Should it be primarily a public initiative to get to green, or should it be private or some mix thereof? So please join us on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. <laughs>